Good evening and uh, welcome to the second of our evening lectures online for 2022. Uh, we're holding these every two months, generally on the last Saturday of every odd numbered month. And uh, I'm delighted this evening to uh, introduce you to Steve Whitehead, who will be presenting our lecture this evening. Steve is another graduate of the British Bible School from many, many years gone by um, and has been one of our regular teachers for a good number of years. But this is actually the first time that we've been able to get him online like this. So um, without more ado, um, let me hand over to you, Steve, and uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. Spoiler alert, Jerusalem gets destroyed several times. And while there are some who believe it will happen again, that is not something on which I am qualified to speak. This talk will be historical, looking back at what happened in the past. I hope there will be lessons to learn from this, but if you're watching, hoping to get some insight into the end times, you've come to the wrong place. I will pass on what my teacher told me and leave it at that. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the cock crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. While Jerusalem was attacked several times in its eventful history, I am concentrating on the catastrophic events of AD 70. This may lead us to wonder if Jerusalem may be destroyed again if the circumstances are repeated. But only time will tell, and I, for one, am not going to make any predictions. It was the Edwardian writer, Saki, the pen name of Hector Munro, who commented that the Greeks had produced too much history for their own use. The same could be said of ancient Israel. So my challenge is to know where to begin. For those that like to look at the back of the book, the short story is that Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. If you did not know that, then you've learned something already. But you may find what I'm going to say a little confusing. I cannot tell this story without lots of names of dead people and too many dates for some. You don't necessarily need to remember much of this. And if you want to check my facts later, there'll be plenty of places to look. And we will make the text of this talk available through the BBS website later. I am going to try to give you a broad overview of why Jerusalem came to be destroyed and go into a little more detail as to how it happened. In doing so, we go beyond the scope of the Bible. New Testament history ends with Paul in prison in Rome, continuing to share the good news of Jesus and writing letters to his co-workers around the Roman Empire. I would date Paul's execution to late 66 or early 67, while Nero was still emperor of Rome. I can explain how and why I come to that conclusion some other time. I believe that the last New Testament book to be written was Revelation, which was an inspired commentary on the Jewish war. If you want the short guide to what Revelation is about, I can give it to you. The Lamb defeats the beast. 
Again, I can show you how I reached that conclusion some other time. So how did the Jews come to be at war with a mighty Roman Empire? Before we answer that, we first need to introduce our sources. We start with a Jewish historian with a Roman name, Flavius Josephus. There was once a time when every literate home would have a Bible, King James Version, of course, along with Cruden's Concordance and Whiston's Josephus. William Whiston, who lived from 1667 to 1752, mainly in or near Cambridge, was a prolific writer on a variety of subjects, including mathematics, becoming professor of mathematics at the University of Cambridge when he succeeded Isaac Newton in 1703. However, he's now known mainly for his best-selling translation of the complete works of Josephus. Unfortunately for us, Whiston wrote in the language of his time and place. He was an erudite and otiose scholar whose English is now almost incomprehensible. Yea, even for ye that readeth the King James Version for Bible study and John Milton for pleasure. I can almost guarantee that you will find a copy of Whiston's Josephus, or at least parts of it, in almost any second-hand bookshop in Great Britain. And the book is still in print in the States. But while you can check references in Whiston, I'm pretty certain that you'll not be able to read it. So my advice is to put it back on the shelf and find a more modern translation, of which there are plenty. We cannot ignore Josephus. While his Antiquities of the Jews is little more than a paraphrase of the historical material in the Old Testament, his Jewish War is a treasure trove of useful information that we would not find anywhere else. As the American scholar Paul Mayer says in his introduction to his edition of Josephus, Josephus provides probably 300 times as much information about Herod the Great as does the Gospel of Matthew, for example, or 10 times as much about Pontius Pilate. He also furnishes fascinating perspectives on such other biblical figures as Archelaus, Herod Antipas, the two Agrippas, Felix and Festus, as well as intriguing sidelights on John the Baptist, Jesus' half-brother James and Jesus himself. We know that Josephus is an honest and impartial historian because he says he is. Indeed, he tells us quite a lot about himself. Some of the events he describes in the Jewish war, he participated in as a commander of the Jewish forces in Galilee, and after his surrender, as a member of the Roman staff where he offered his services as translator and negotiator. Having written his account of the Jewish rebellion for a Greek speaking readership, he found himself under attack from some of his Jewish compatriots and responded by writing a short autobiography. This does not always clarify matters, as what he says in this life contradicts what he previously said in his history, which has meant that subsequent readers have had to make up their own minds. Josephus is undoubtedly a useful historical source, and at some points, our sole surviving witness. So if we refuse to accept his testimony, we're left with nothing, but he is biased, although perhaps not always deliberately and must be handled with caution. So who was Flavius Josephus? He was born as Joseph, the son of Matthias, and had both priestly and noble blood, with both of his parents being from upper class families. His date of birth was AD 37 or 38, at the start of the reign of Gaius Caligula in Rome. And so as a child and young man, he was living during the time covered by Luke in the Book of Acts. He studied in Jerusalem 
and eventually followed the interpretation of Torah as understood by the Pharisees. He knew some Greek, but when he started his literary career, wrote in Aramaic and brought in help to translate. In first century Rome, Greek was the language of literature, not Latin. When the Jewish rebellion broke out in 66, Joseph, like many wealthy Jews at the time, was opposed to it, probably realizing that anti-Roman uprisings only ever ended in defeat, as had already happened in Gaul and Britannia. However, Joseph returned home and became commander of the Jewish rebels in Galilee. Did he really believe the mighty Roman Empire could be overthrown by a bunch of Jewish desperados? More likely, he hoped to be able to negotiate from a position of strength. If the Galilee garrison could delay the legions coming from Syria, they might, possibly, perhaps, have been a chance of negotiating and gaining sufficient concessions from Rome to enable Joseph and like-minded moderates to persuade the hardline rebels to compromise, which with hindsight was never gonna happen. By 67, Joseph had been driven back into one of the few remaining rebel strongholds, Jotapata. Siege warfare was a Roman strength. And while the rebels delayed the inevitable, that was all it was, a delay. The Romans built siege towers, covered them with metal so as to stop the rebels setting fire to them and hauled them into position, towering above the ramparts of Jotapata, meaning that Roman archers and slingshot throwers could soon clear the walls of defenders. Eventually, a Jewish fighter tried to escape and was captured. Under interrogation, he revealed that the Jewish guard was not at its most vigilant in the hours before dawn. The Roman commander, Vespasian, ordered his son Titus to lead a raid. A hand-picked commando squad climbed the walls, silenced the few guards they found and opened the gates. The end was quick and brutal. Joseph and about 40 rebels found a hiding place in a pit at the back of a cave, but the Romans found them. The legionaries were going to smoke out the rebels, but Vespasian wanted the leader taken alive, probably to display him in the victory parade once the war was over. Vespasian sent in an old friend of Joseph's to negotiate. This was Nicanor, who may have been the same Nicanor who was one of Herod Agrippa's officials. The rebels did not want to be taken alive, so Joseph arranged a suicide pact with them drawing lots to determine who was to kill whom. Amazingly, Joseph's was the last name to be drawn, and he persuaded his partner that they should not kill one another, but instead should surrender. Joseph was taken to Vespasian, who honored his promise not to kill him. We're not told what happened to the other survivor, but I rather expect he would have been crucified. Joseph came up with a <clears throat> prophecy, cough, cough, but promised that the man who captured him would one day become emperor. Vespasian was a hard-bitten old soldier, but something about the chutzpah of this captured Jew appealed to him. So Joseph was kept under guard, but attached to the Roman HQ, where later he was used as a negotiator and interpreter. When news came from Rome that the Emperor Nero was dead, Joseph's prophecy did not seem quite so unlikely, and Vespasian started to pay more attention to his captive. Eventually, Joseph followed Vespasian to Rome, where he was granted a state pension, changed his name to the Latin Flavius Josephus, Flavius being Vespasian, now Caesar Vespasian's family name and Josephus set to work on his voluminous writings, but attempted to show how the Jewish rebellion was provoked by poor government from the previous Caesars, Caligula and Nero in particular, and what a wise and wonderful emperor was Vespasian. 
Josephus lived in Rome until his death, sometime around the year 100, having outlived his patron Vespasian and both his sons, the emperors Titus and Domitian. So Josephus is one of our best witnesses for the events of the Jewish war that led to the destruction of Jerusalem. But just how reliable he is can be a matter for debate. Other Jewish survivors despised him, but as the saying goes, history is written by the winners. And by changing sides as he did, Josephus ended up as one of those winners. There's no getting away from Josephus as a prime historical source for the second half of the first century. And he fills in some other gaps from earlier Jewish history. Do we need to read Josephus? No. But he can sometimes shed light on areas that would remain dark without him. Although we must always remember that he is always keen to put himself in the best light possible. And so we should read him with caution. Neither of the two great Latin historians of the first century can compare with Josephus in their coverage of the Jewish war. These are Cornelius Tacitus and Gaius Suetonius Tranquillius. Neither were eyewitnesses and neither were interested in the Jews, except when they were perceived as to be a nuisance in Rome. So Suetonius, writing in the second century about Claudius, records how he had the Jews expelled from Rome because of disturbances initiated by Crestus, which corroborates Luke's account in Acts 18. Tacitus is much more Western looking with a particular interest in Britannia, where his father-in-law, Agricola, had commanded the 20th Legion. Tacitus notes the Jewish war, but mainly for the light it sheds on the rise of Vespasian and his son Titus. His description of Jerusalem makes it sound impregnable, which is his usual approach. Tacitus likes to big up the enemies of Rome so as to make the inevitable Roman victory sound even more impressive. There is no evidence that Tacitus ever travelled in the East, and his brief account of the Jewish war sounds like he'd read Josephus. However, neither Tacitus nor Suetonius directly contradict Josephus, and while they are helpful in understanding imperial policy and the impact of the Jewish rebellion on Rome, we have to say that when compared to Josephus, they are of less importance. There are other Roman sources. Pliny adds some detail to our understanding of the geography, for example, but nothing that can replace Josephus for our purposes. The Romans did a thorough job of obliterating Jerusalem, leaving just one wall, the Western Wall, still visible today. The retaining walls from Solomon's original temple were strengthened and increased in size when Herod redeveloped and expanded the site. These walls ran for about 305 metres or 1,000 feet in length, and by filling in behind them and also constructing vaults later used for storage, a level platform was made. One of these massive retaining walls is still intact. This is the Western Wall, popularly known as the Wailing Wall, and today considered as one of the holiest sites for Jews, being the closest they can get to their ancient temple. If you want to make a virtual visit, the wall has its own website. However, when the biblical city of Jerusalem is gone, the topography of the site is less changed. Jerusalem was, and is, a city on a hill with relatively steep approaches from most directions. It had some natural springs and over the years, the Jews had dug cisterns and constructed pools to store water. So in some respects, those on the inside were better supplied than any besieging army. But of course, sooner or later, the food would run out, as we shall see. As well as studying the site of Jerusalem, 
archaeologists can transfer knowledge gained elsewhere and apply it. Roman weapons and armour, for example, were pretty much unchanged around the empire. So a sword found near Hadrian's Wall or the remains of a Roman siege engine found in Gaul can shed light on the Roman army that attacked Jerusalem. So having assembled our witnesses, let us see if we can reconstruct what happened to Jerusalem in the year 70. It is during the reign of Claudius from 41 to 54 that many of the events in the book of Acts occurred. Jesus was born in the reign of Augustus, died in the reign of Tiberius, Caligula's reign was so brief as to make no impression in the New Testament, and Acts and most of the letters come under Claudius and Nero. All the way through the first century, the Roman Empire remained the dominant power, but there was a decline in political stability. So by the time we reach Nero, who reigned from 54 to 68, we have a man with absolute power who became absolutely corrupted by this power. Like Caligula and Claudius before him, Nero took no active part in military affairs. The Boudican rebellion in Britain was eventually put down by the local commanders and General Corbulo drove the Parthians out of Armenia, securing the empire's eastern frontier for a generation. The legions and their commanders began to realize that it made little difference who was in power back in Rome. And around the empire, the ordinary people were increasingly wondering what Rome had ever done for them. Taxation only ever went up and the caliber of Roman administrators seemed only to go down. And in Judea in particular, there was much dissatisfaction about how they were ruled. Portius Festus was Nero's first appointment in Judea when he replaced the homeward bound Antonius Felix, who was Claudius's man. Both Felix and Festus appear in Acts when Paul was removed to Caesarea for his own safety. Festus had had to clear up the mess left by Felix who had allowed tensions between Greek-speaking Syrians and Aramaic-speaking Jews in Caesarea to get out of hand. Festus tried to pass the buck back to Rome, which meant the dispute dragged on even longer. While this was going on, the dagger-wielding assassins known as Sicarii stepped up their attacks on Roman collaborators. Festus died in office in 62 leaving a period when there was no governor, which allowed the high priest, Ananus, son of Ananus, to use his initiative and get rid of some of those he considered to be public nuisances, which included James the Just, the half-brother of Jesus. Lucius Albinus arrived later in 62 and quickly set about making his fortune by accepting bribes and demanding ransom money before freeing prisoners. He moved on to Mauritania in North Africa, being replaced by Gessius Florus, the last procurator before the rebellion of 66. Josephus wrote that compared to Florus, Albinus had been a paragon of virtue, as Albinus at least tried to hide his crimes while Florus was proud of them. In May 66, Florus ordered the massacre of several thousand Jewish protesters, including some who held Roman citizenship. Earlier in the year, Florus had <clears throat> borrowed money from the temple treasury. Some Jewish wit had organized a special collection to help out the impoverished procurator who took his revenge by killing some 3,000 peaceful protesters. Florus's line manager, Cestius Gallus, the governor of Syria, was not impressed, but the damage had been done and the Jews were ready to rise up 
against the empire. Over the centuries, there were many rebellions against Rome, from the social wars in Italy at the very start of the Republic, through to the revolts in Gaul and Britain. But the Jewish war is the only one where we hear a voice from the other side. Our witness is Josephus, and while he is often unreliable, if we acknowledge his biases, we can glean some useful information from him. Josephus's major bias is in favour of himself. He is one of those writers who never knowingly made a mistake. Also, he favours people like him, moderate Hellenised Jews, who could see either the advantages of coming to an accommodation with Rome or putting it the other way, the futility of opposing Rome. Judea was in a bad way. Basically, there was not enough land to go around, land in the sense of fertile agricultural land. Most small holdings were just too small to support the number of mouths that had to be fed. Galilee was more productive, but still not sufficiently so as to feed the hungry from Judea, at least not once the Romans had taken their cut. So the peasant farmers of Judea were living very close to the breadline, and desperate people sometimes do desperate things. As I have said, under Procurator Florus, the situation went from bad to worse. In May 66, the disturbances in Jerusalem got so out of hand that Florus withdrew his troops. Roman legionaries may have been elite fighters, but their battlefield tactics were of little use in vicious street fighting. The Jewish insurrectionists knew Jerusalem better than the Roman occupiers, and the locals were much more prepared to help the rebels than to support the Romans. In August, anti-insurrectionist Jews, along with King Herod Agrippa's militia, were defeated by the rebels. In November, the Syrian governor, Cestius Gallus, sent in his legions. They were unable to retake Jerusalem, and with the country now up in arms, the commander tried to withdraw to the coast. However, the terrain was against the Romans. A relatively narrow road descending through steep and in places almost mountainous hills did not allow the legions to form up in battle order and the supporting cavalry were unable to get to grips with the elusive Jewish guerrillas. Day after day these guerrillas were able to pick off Romans from a safe distance using slingshots and javelins and then disappear into the wilderness before the Romans could retaliate. In the pass of Beth Horon, the Roman retreat became a rout, with approximately 5,300 legionaries, out of a total of 30,000, being killed, along with about 480 cavalry and three senior officers. In addition to inflicting casualties, the Jews were able to capture much of the Roman baggage train, including food, weapons and siege engines. It was a humiliating defeat for Rome and an inspiring victory for the Jews. Surely it was said by many of the rebel leaders, the Lord is on our side. Who can stand against us? Just as Judas Maccabeus had defeated the mighty Syrian army, his descendants had done the same to Rome. But Rome was not Syria. Some, including Josephus, knew that Rome's response would be deadly. If they could not defeat the Jews in open battle, they would starve them out. If the guerrillas withdrew into the wilderness, the Romans would destroy every town and village and devastate the harvest. If they had to leave Judea a desert in order to defeat the rebels, then that is what they would do. Our main source for what happened is Josephus. Tacitus tells us the result, and spoiler alert again, Rome wins, but Josephus tells the story. By modern standards of historiography, Josephus is a questionable guide, but he's the only one we have. Yes, he has an agenda. Basically, that Josephus was right, 
and all the other Jews who refused to take his sound advice got what was coming to them. Archaeologists and students of the Roman army questioned some of his numbers, but if we're too critical of Josephus, we're left with next to nothing in coming to understand what happened and, more importantly, why. So what follows is a summary of books five to nine of the Jewish War. If some of it is fiction, or to be kinder, wishful thinking on the part of Josephus, it is still a memorable story of great heroism told in horrific detail. There was no Geneva Convention and no Red Cross. This was war to the knife. Perhaps there was an element of self-fulfilling prophecy in what happened next, or perhaps Josephus was a shrewd tactician. But the Romans did as he expected and rolled up the Galilee garrisons in swift order. The two large towns in Galilee under rebel control, Sepphoris and Tiberias, were fortified and garrisoned, along with about 20 larger villages and defensible hilltops. Josephus's mistake was in adopting a passive defence, waiting for the Romans to come to him. After the rout of Cestius Gallus on his retreat from Jerusalem, the Emperor Nero appointed a veteran commander of Claudius's conquest of Britain to clear up the mess in Judea. This was Titus Flavius Vespasianus, who we usually know as Vespasian. Vespasian travelled to Syria to collect the legions based there, the 5th and 10th, along with 29 battalions of auxiliaries and troops from local Roman client kings, including some loyal to Herod Agrippa. These auxiliary troops tended to be archers, cavalry and scouts to support the legions who did the heavy work. While he was in Antioch, Vespasian sent his son Titus to Egypt to take command of the 15th Legion. Eventually, the Roman army mustered at Ptolemais in southwestern Syria. Josephus estimates that there were 60,000 soldiers there, but this probably includes all and sundry, Roman legionaries, auxiliaries, and all the many and various hangers-on and camp followers that served the fighting men, smiths, cooks, servants, baggage handlers, and so on. But three legions was a formidable force, even without any of the support units. That would be 15,000 professional, heavily armoured soldiers, led by 180 centurions. Josephus had a problem. His lightly armoured and relatively untrained and inexperienced militia could not meet one Roman legion in battle, let alone three. As his fighters started to make their excuses and leave, Josephus gave the order to withdraw to the strong points around Galilee, taking his bodyguard to Tiberias to await developments. Vespasian moved on Gabara, about 12 miles from Ptolemais, and made an example of it. The town was razed, its defenders killed, and any survivors taken to be sold as slaves. In a single day, Gabara ceased to exist. This is how Rome won its wars. As the news spread, and we can be sure that the Romans made sure it did, the pro-Roman Hellenists were encouraged and the Jewish rebels disheartened. Josephus realised that Jotapata was the key to Galilee. Whoever controlled it could control the entire region. So he withdrew from Tiberias to reinforce Jotapata. If the Romans could be repulsed there, they may have to withdraw to Syria to regroup, buying the Jews much needed time to build up their own army and perhaps to persuade potential allies to join them. Vespasian knew that if he took Jotapata, the other forts in Galilee could be picked off at will and the road to Judea would be open. 
So the siege of Jotapata was the key battle in the Galilee campaign. The winner would take all. Unfortunately for Josephus and his men, the Romans were rather good at siege warfare. I've already told you that Jotapata was captured and that Josephus talked his way into the good books of the future emperor Vespasian, so you know what's going to happen. I think it's worth spending some time at the siege of Jotapata, as in many ways it was a foretaste of what was later going to happen at Jerusalem. Ancient siege warfare followed an almost predetermined order. Once the besieging army had encircled the city, there was one last opportunity for those inside to surrender. Depending on the general state of affairs in the ongoing war, the soon to be captured city may be spared on condition that the garrison change sides or hostages might be taken to guarantee future good behaviour and always there would be a large fine to pay, but most of the citizens would be spared. However, if the city surrendered and then rebelled again, or if the city refused to surrender, there would be no mercy. Every man under arms would die, either in battle or on a cross after the battle was won. Non-combatants would be sold as slaves, and those with no commercial value, the old and the infirm, would be left to fend for themselves. Most ancient sieges were a battle of attrition. Who would run out of an essential supply first? In Galilee and Judea, a key factor was always the water supply. If a city did not have a spring of sufficient capacity, the besieged had to survive on what they could store until the rainy season started and they could refill their systems. Those outside could get water brought to them, but if the nearest stream was some distance away, a great deal of time and effort would be spent on filling barrels and water jars and hauling them to those that needed it. And if the supply of clean water ran out, there was a much greater possibility of disease. Then there was the food supply. A well-supplied fortress may start with more food than those besieging it, particularly if the surrounding countryside had been devastated. But eventually, those on the inside will start to go hungry. Another key consideration is munitions. <coughs> Sooner or later, those inside the walls will run out of arrows and slingshot. Those on the outside may also run short, but it will be easier for them to send back to the depot to get more while all the defenders can do is look for spent arrows and shot and shoot them back again. As the besiegers start to dig in around the fort, the defenders may try to mount a sortie. This involves a quick breakout by mobile troops to capture or burn supplies and to generally disrupt the besiegers' preparations. At this point, if the besiegers are not very well prepared, they might have to withdraw but three Roman legions are not easily driven back. And while the Jews at Jotapata and later at Jerusalem caused some disruption to the Roman siege works, they were not decisive. The Romans dug in. Where possible, Romans would try to launch a quick, and they hoped, decisive attack. If they could rush a gate or get sufficient men over a wall, then they would win by weight of numbers. If this did not succeed, then they were prepared to work for their victory. Ladders were no use at Jotapata, as Josephus had made sure that the walls were too high. 30 feet, or 10 metres if you prefer, was usually considered the maximum length of a siege ladder. Any longer, and it would be too heavy to manoeuvre into position, particularly when defenders were shooting arrows and dropping rocks on those at the bottom. The Romans had, by the first century, devised some useful pieces of equipment that could damage houses behind the walls or keep defenders off the ramparts from such a distance that the defenders could not strike back. These included the dart-throwing corabalista, 
the light bolt shooter Scorpio, the heavy spear shooter Catapulta, and the large catapult for hurling boulders, the Onaga. Josephus identifies the Scorpio and Catapulta as being used at Jotapata, and no doubt the heavier Onaga would have been useful when they reached Jerusalem. If the Romans could keep the Jewish defenders off the walls, it was possible to deploy a battering ram. This would be covered with a protective roof, and while it was not a quick way in, it was effective, and the steady pounding would work on the nerves of the defenders as they waited for the inevitable collapse of the wall or gate that was under attack. There was always an element of psychological warfare in any siege. The massed lines of Roman legionaries always just a little bit out of range. The relentless bombardment of boulders from the onager, the arrows and bolts constantly sweeping the ramparts, and the boom as the battering ram hit home again and again. The defenders knew what was coming, and knew there was nothing they could do to prevent it. Even escape was impossible. The Romans were always on the watch for anyone who tried to slip away, and the remaining defenders would see their former comrades dying on crosses around the fortress. Still, Jotapata withstood the attacks, so the Romans built siege towers. These were taller than the city walls, covered in metal plates to prevent them from being burned. And once they'd been rolled into position, Roman archers and auxiliary sling shooters could fire down onto the defenders. At Jotapata, the Romans had three siege towers at work. The constant bombardment and sense of inevitability were wearing down the resilience of the defenders. The end came suddenly. A captured Jewish deserter told Vespasian that there were few sentries on duty before dawn. Titus led a commando raid, climbed the wall shortly before sunrise on the 1st of July and opened one of the city gates. The legionaries rushed in and the defence crumbled. The siege of Jotapata had held up the Roman army for two months, but now Galilee was completely under Roman control. Now they could march on Jerusalem. Vespasian knew the situation was under control. Galilee, the Golan and Transjordan were all pacified. The road to and from Syria was open and Rome controlled enough of the Mediterranean coast to be confident that supplies and reinforcements were there for the asking. The remaining Jewish rebels were concentrating on Jerusalem and its surrounding forts, so Vespasian had them where he wanted them. True, the terrain was hostile, and by all accounts Jerusalem was a well-fortified city, but Vespasian was in no hurry. The rebels were not going to go anywhere, and the chance of outside help arriving had gone. The Jews might call upon their strange god, but Rome, thought Vespasian, had more and better gods. This was only going to end one way, although given the situation in Rome with Nero's increasing instability, Vespasian decided to leave the mopping up to his son Titus, while Vespasian himself moved to Egypt to better monitor the situation. Of course, many of the Jewish defenders of Jerusalem were convinced that God was on their side, and it was only a matter of time before he acted, as he had done during the Maccabean Rebellion against Antiochus Epiphanes all those years ago, or more recently, in the victory at Beth-Horon, when Cestius Gallus and his legion were routed. However, it was about now that many of the remaining Christians in Jerusalem remembered the warning Jesus had given his disciples when they asked about the coming end in Mark 13 and its parallels. They withdrew to the town of Pella. The Jews never forgave them, 
And this event made the complete break between Christianity and Judaism irreversible. Now is not the time to discuss other references to the impending end of the old Jewish temple system in the New Testament. Hebrews is a good place to look, but the clearest indication that the times were a changing was for ripping apart of the temple curtain from top to bottom, as recorded in Mark 15 and the parallels in Matthew and Luke. However, this takes us into the realm of theology, which is not my topic for tonight. So we note it and move on. As the Roman legions closed in on Jerusalem, the defenders started to argue and then fight amongst themselves. Our only source here is Josephus, who is now on the outside working for Titus as his paying expert on Jewish affairs and general translator and negotiator. So Josephus has his own agenda and his knowledge of what was happening in the city came from hearsay, not personal experience, although he did know some of the key players. So while we would be wise not to assume Josephus is without bias, we can still get sufficient useful information to see what was happening in the city. The internal bickering between the various Jewish factions made the fall of the city inevitable. Titus was not ready to press home a Roman attack for reasons we will explore shortly. The lull in the war should have allowed the Jews to regroup and prepare for the final battle. But instead, the civil war in Jerusalem merely made the Roman victory easier. Why did Titus delay? In brief, Nero lost the plot. While he was generally popular with the ordinary people, the plebeians in Latin, who enjoyed his showmanship, those further up the social scale were not amused. The Senate thought Nero ridiculous, and the aristocrats who paid for Nero's excesses through ever-increasing taxation had had enough. In March 68, Nero's rules started to unravel. Julius Vindex, governor of Gaul, led a revolt and was quickly supported by Severus Sulpicius Galba in Spain and Marcus Otho in Lusitania, modern Portugal. Nero lost his nerve and, abandoned by his guards and servants, took his own life on the 9th of June, AD 68, aged 30. He left no heir. Index had not planned ahead and all, had already been defeated by the Rhine legions in May 68, while Nero still lived. But the army had lost confidence in Nero and wanted one of their own to take over. The Senate invited Galba, then aged 70, to take control. But the Rhine legions wanted their own commander, Aulus Vitellius, as Caesar. This is January 69. Galba handled the situation in Rome with a distinct lack of tact, and the Praetorian guards, the only professional soldiers in the city, declared for Otho. Galba was killed on his way to the Forum, and the Senate, faced with Hobson's choice, followed the Praetorians in declaring for Otho. Otho attempted to unify the factions by restoring Nero's statues and reinstating some of his officials, while also trying to secure peace with Vitellius by offering to share power and marrying Vitellius's daughter. However, Vitellius saw this as a sign of weakness on Otho's part and continued his march on Rome. On the 14th of April, 69, Vitellius's legions defeated those of Otho at the First Battle of Cremona. And two days later, on the 16th of April, 69, Otho took his own life. Vitellius continued Otho's policy of reconciliation, but power was now in the hands of his German legions. In the middle of July 69, news reached Rome that the Eastern legions were refusing to accept Vitellius as Caesar and had instead declared for their own general Vespasian 
currently on campaign in Judea. With Egypt declaring for Vespasian, the grain supply for Rome was under threat. Then the commanders of the Danube legions also declared for Vespasian and immediately set off for Italy. Although outnumbered, the Danube legions moved swiftly and took the battalions off guard, routing them at the Second Battle of Cremona on the 25th of October, 69. While Vitellius retreated to Rome, most of his remaining troops switched sides. Vespasian's elder brother, Titus Flavius Sabinus, led an advance guard into Rome, captured Vitellius and had him executed. Vespasian, now in Alexandria, sailed for Rome as soon as the weather allowed in the spring of 70 and arrived in the city by summer. Four Caesars in one year was too much for most people and Vespasian was welcomed as the one who would bring, bring back peace and stability. The only remaining trouble spot in the vast Roman Empire was back in Judea, but Vespasian was confident that his son Titus would soon have the situation under control. The Jews in Jerusalem were divided and, as a wise teacher once pointed out, a city divided against itself will soon fall. Josephus, still our best source, was no friend of the leaders of the rebel factions and so maybe presenting them in the worst possible light. By the time Josephus wrote his account, his patron, Vespasian, had restored order in Rome and Josephus contrasts his success with the self-inflicted failings of the defenders of Jerusalem. Within Jerusalem, some, mainly from the aristocratic Sadducees and the chief priests, were in favour of negotiating with the Romans, but the extremists wanted war, with many believing that God would come in on their side when the time was right. The war party was led by Eleazar, son of Simon, who was one of the commanders in the defeat of Cestius Gallus. Josephus labels Eleazar and those like him as zealots, which he uses as a term of disapproval. As Vespasian concluded his mopping up operations in Galilee, many other zealots made their way to Jerusalem to await the end, which they would probably have written with a capital E, the end. Eleazar and his supporters now tried to bring pressure to bear on the priests. They took control of the temple and appointed a new high priest, this one decided upon by the drawing of lots. Ananus, now the ex-high priest, still had sufficient popular support to lead an attack on the temple courtyards, driving Eleazar and his zealots inside. The zealots were reinforced by fighters from Gishala, who had been defeated by Titus. These men were led by John of Gishala, who had initially promised to support Ananus and had recommended calling for help from Idumea, Herod the Great's homeland. The Idumeans duly arrived and combined with the zealots to retake the temple courts and, in the process, killed Ananus, who now became a dead ex-high priest. The zealots then took revenge on the moderates within the city with such brutality that the Idumeans abandoned Eleazar and returned home. The extremists now controlled all of Jerusalem and much good it was going to do them. You will forgive my spoilers, but I'm pretty sure you all know where this story is heading. The Zealot Party soon split, with some following Eleazar and others John of Gishala. In spring 69, another war band entered the city, this one commanded by Simon Bargiora from Gerasa, who had more recently been based in Masada. In the struggle that followed, this is before the Romans arrived outside Jerusalem, remember, Simon, with about 15,000 followers, controlled most of the city. John and his 6,000 followers occupied the outer courts of the temple and parts of the lower city, and the remaining zealots held the inner temple with about 2,400 men. 
As Titus arrived outside Jerusalem in the spring of 70, John used the opening of the temple for Passover as his opportunity to storm the inner courts and force the defenders to join him against Simon. As Titus and his legions drew ever closer to the city, the two factions finally agreed to combine and fight the Romans instead of each other. Too late. In the Civil War, not only had hundreds of Jewish fighters been killed or wounded, the main grain stores had been burned in a fire. According to Josephus, by the time Jerusalem had fallen, some 600,000 had died of starvation. In the spring of the year 70, Titus was ready to finish the war. At Passover time, he moved his troops closer to the city. This made it almost impossible for Jewish reinforcements to get in and much more dangerous for those from inside the city to get out, either to escape or to scavenge for food. The first Roman assault came from the north, where the hill was not so steep. It took two weeks, but by May, the Romans had breached Agrippa's wall. The defenders kept sending out sorties to slow the Roman advance towards the second north wall and the Antonia fortress. So Titus responded by ordering the construction of a four mile long wall around the city, a circumvallation. Now there was no way out for those remaining inside the city and the defenders were getting hungry. In July, the second north wall was breached and the Antonia was taken, making the temple the next target. By the 9th of August, the temple courts were taken and the Romans made a point of making a sacrifice to their legionary standards within the temple precincts. Jewish casualties continued to mount and John of Gishala, who'd been in command in the temple, withdrew to the upper city. In September, Titus ordered the sacking of the city. Anything portable was to be taken, anything that remained was to be burnt. After clearing the lower city, the Romans took the upper city in a single day. John and Simon tried to tunnel their way out, but both were taken captive. Titus then ordered the raising of the city walls and the temple, leaving just Herod's three towers and part of the western wall to show, as Josephus said, the character and strength of the city. The Romans always liked to make it clear that their enemies were strong and courageous, as it made their own and their commander sound even greater. But leaving aside the propaganda, this was a crushing defeat for the Jewish rebels. Nearly 100,000 prisoners including John and Simon, were dispatched to Rome to be put on show in Vespasian's triumph the following year. The fall and destruction of Jerusalem and its temple in AD 70 effectively ended the Jewish war. There was still some mopping up to be done in the Judean wilderness with the fortresses of Herodian, Makeros, and eventually Masada being taken between 71 and 73. The last stand at Masada is rightly remembered as a brave but ultimately futile gesture of defiance, with the majority of the defenders choosing to die at their own hands than to face crucifixion after the inevitable defeat. It's a great story and David Kossoff's moving retelling in the form of a novel the voices of Masada is worth reading. But here we must finish. Jerusalem was garrisoned by the 10th Legion, and after the Bar Kokhba revolt of 132 to 135, the Emperor Hadrian refounded the city as a military colony, Aelia Capitolina, and the Jews were once more went into exile around the empire and beyond. It was a hard lesson for the Jewish people to learn. No doubt some and perhaps many sincerely believed that God would intervene to defeat Rome and restore their kingdom. 
that God had other plans and had already established a new kingdom, a kingdom not of this world, with a king who reigns forever. If only his chosen people had had eyes to see and ears to hear. Well, thank you for your attention. That was, uh, as I said at the beginning, it has to be just a very broad brushstroke retelling. Um, if you want to find out more, I recommend perhaps a visit to your local library, see if they've got the Penguin Classic translation of Josephus. As I said at the start, Wiston, easy to find second hand, difficult to read, uh, but there are more modern translations and the Josephus is a, is a great read, even if we don't necessarily need to know much about this uh, for understanding the Bible story. It is, I think, perhaps a good way of ending the New Testament. The temple is gone uh, beyond hope of reconstruction. So that concludes our lecture for tonight. If you want to send any messages across, uh, by all means, use the chat button. I, I do thank Patrick for his help with the visuals. I could not have done that without him. And uh, as I say, we'll, we'll try and get this in some form up onto the website so you can either read my notes or, or watch the broadcast again at a later date.